people are taking ownership of it in a huge way because it means so much to them. And that's what I find incredibly rewarding is that it means something to somebody that there's a lot of people out there that, that take some kind of, that have some kind of relationship with mm -hmm. the material. That's why I make movies that I want to touch lives. I want to move people. And, um, that's one of the joys of, of making Disney movies, to be quite honest with you, is that you get to have some influence on the world in some ways, right? Hey everyone, Corey here, middle of the day. If I'm here in the middle of the day, on a day like this, then something special is happening. And uh, this will be a very special interview for a lot of you out there, I'm sure, but this is uh, definitely something that is pretty incredible for me. Uh, a lot of you know that I have a background in animation, therefore I've told you about the things that I've grown up with, the things I've studied, the people I've admired. And today we have someone that I can say has definitely had an influence on my life, and that is Mr. Kevin Lima. Kevin Lima is a legendary animator, has worked on so <laughs> he, he chuckles right now, but it's true. <laughs> he has worked on so many things that have had such a huge impact on our culture, anywhere from several Disney movies, uh, a Little Mermaid, Tarzan, Beauty and the Beast. He's worked on other projects that uh, we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, projects that didn't happen that I wish did, but we'll cover all that hopefully in the time that we have. Uh, thank you, Kevin, for joining us today. Oh, it's good to be here. It's good to talk to you. Uh, you know. We're going to talk about your career and a few other things, and and again, the impact that you had on a lot of generations. But I want to start out talking about one of the things that you've done early on in your career, and that would be the Brave Little Toaster. The Brave Little Toaster is something I think that you've done. It was one of the first things that you did in your animation career. Uh, I love that movie, by the way. I, when I talk about it, your influence, I've studied this movie to learn how to draw when I was a kid. Uh, one of the few movies I learned how to draw from when I was a kid. Uh, you had to go to Taiwan to work on this film, I right? Did. I did. How did, you, how, did you, was... how did you end up in Taiwan? Well, it's, this movie started in L.A., and I did some experimental animation on it. I was fresh out of school, and um, we, thought, uh, we all thought we were going to be hired by Disney. And that didn't happen that year. The Black Cauldron had come out and uh, they were struggling. So they didn't hire anyone from CalArts. I went to CalArts. And uh, so we all had to go out into the world and find, uh, and find jobs. I got a job, luckily, on the Brave Little Toaster, which, uh, which involved, uh, to begin with, me doing some experimental animation because the whole thing was going to be animated overseas in Taiwan. And then they wanted to bring over some animators and they asked if I'd, uh, if I'd be willing to go on the adventure and I, I signed up. Nice. How, so, yeah. so, uh, was that your time, first time traveling overseas at that time? It was, it was going to California was my first time traveling within the country. And that's uh, Cal Arts is in uh, California. I grew up in Rhode Island. And so it was quite a quite a culture shock going to Taiwan, but but I have to say I'm I'm happy I did it. Right, it was a great a great adventure with a with a truly talented and influential group of people who I became friends with and have stayed friends with all my life. Nice, very nice. You know, yeah. uh, speaking of the impact that you've had on a lot of young people, one of the things that you've worked on and. This is something I'm sure you've talked about many times, but uh, um, our viewers want to hear about this. Uh, you worked on and directed the Goofy movie, which I did. Yeah, which is a huge hit with millennials out there, and I'm sure with younger generations too. Um, you know, the success of this movie came after its theatrical release. I think it became popular on home release. You know, with the movie being so popular, you know, probably more than ever today. Why do you think that this didn't do well theatrically? Well, it's kind of an interest. It was an interesting time, right? This uh, the Goofy movie was made under under the tutelage um, of Jeffrey Katzenberg, and when this movie came out, Jeffrey had just um, left the studio, so he was a big um, supporter of making movies at a cheaper price point. This movie cost a lot less. I'm telling you, a lot, lot less than a, than a Disney feature animated movie. 
And um, so he was a big proponent of that. And when he left, of course, you know, all of that needed to just be uh, swept under the rug, right? Nobody, nobody wanted there to be a, a cheap solution to making animated movies, especially Disney feature animation didn't want that to happen. So they just pulled all the support. Um, that's one of the reasons, right, is nobody knew it was out there in the world. Um, I can't really guess as to what the other reasons may be. I mean, it's a supporting character. It's a character that you had seen on television, right? So this is based on the Goof Troop TV show. And it's hard, I think, to get people to go to the movies when they've been watching something for free for so long, <laughs> yeah. right? So they've been yeah. watching Goof Troop all those years, and suddenly we're asking you to pay <laughs> whatever, seven, five, seven bucks to go see it. And I'm not sure people were, were willing to do that. And one of the very interesting things about this movie and the the, the turn that it's taken lately is, uh, and you've talked about this, I've read you talking about this, um, you've talked about yourself how a goofy movie and uh, how the black community loves it, how the black community Thank just kind of taken ownership of this film right here. Mm -hmm. uh, this was further shown by an episode of Atlanta, which we've talked right. about before. Uh, the goof who sat by the door. Would, for those who probably don't know, it's, it's again, it's very interesting and hilarious what they did with it. It's um, it's about instead of you, a white guy <laughs> that directed yeah. this, uh, <laughs> there's another universe where it's a black guy that did it. It's the multiverse. It's the multiverse. Unless you were in blackface at the time, which I'm sure you weren't. So, uh, <laughs> um, but I want to play a little clip about uh, the director in this universe, how he came to get the idea for the Goofy movie. Thomas used this text as the center of a piece of a series he called Goofy, Please. After class one day, he showed me some of these pieces, and I looked at it, and I looked at him, and I thought, this kid is from another universe, like a whole nother planet. <laughs> now, what we, for those who might be listening, most people are watching this, but for those who are listening, uh, Goofy Please was showing Goofy in certain scenarios of black culture at the barbershop and whatnot and uh playing basketball love his shirt yeah look at his yeah. shirt it's hilarious. <laughs> As the, the, the 90s multicolored yeah. shirt that every black per person wore at the time uh <laughs> you might have some yourself kevin but <laughs> but uh the, the the of course not this was in the movie uh the goofy movie but you uh you know, you you were talking about how you appreciate that black people have just taken ownership over this. What what do you think is the reason that the black community loves the Goofy movie so much? Oh boy, um, these these kinds of questions are always hard to answer, right? I mean, you can only assume ever um, that you that you know what you're talking about when you when you talk about these kinds of things. Um, I think there's some there's some DNA in the movie that. Uh, that really relates to the black community. I think there's, uh, I mean, you start with Powerline, right? Obviously, he is a, a black superstar um, singer, right? We went out of our way to make sure that we were doing something contemporary and we chose that image, sort of a combination of Prince, Bobby Brown, and uh, who else is in there? There's a couple of people in there. Um, and uh, was, Mike, we, was Michael we, Jackson in there at all? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there is some Michael Jackson, right? Max at one point does the does the the moonwalk. That um, so that's definitely a takeoff. Um, but you know, so 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 that in its DNA, right there, is about that community. Um, I think there are also some tropes in the movie that sort of relate. I think they relate across all cultures, really. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up without a dad, right? So this movie was really about me exploring what what it would be to to be in this moment in time with your dad um sort of a fantasy of, of something i never got to have uh and i think that you know that's a kind of a common theme a lot i mean you tell me you you can you know help me out here but i think that that's there there are some real sort of common sort of ideas max being told that he's a juvenile delinquent right that i think um 
And you tell me your community dealt with that, that racial profiling yeah. in a big way. Yeah. Right. So, so I think there are those little things, those little hints that feel, that feel right on. I mean, they're not black. They're, they're dogs, right? They're, they're <laughs> human nests. They're humans with dog heads, right? So they're not white and not black. In fact, if you look at that picture right there, you know, he's kind of half and half. He's got, you know, a, a white muzzle, but he's got a whole head of black ears, right? He has black arms and black legs. Um, so I think uh, the characters belong to everybody. And, um, you know, the black community just saw something, uh, something specific in it. You know, it's, it's, it's rare that one of the guests would ask me what I, what I think about it or help me out here or whatever. But, uh, you know, and I, and I usually like to sit back and just let No, no, the, what the do you talk. think? Because it's, I mean, it's a great conversation. It's, and it's, and it's, it's topical, right? Yeah. Okay, well, you know, I would say that as a, as a black kid growing up who loved animation and really adored Disney animation and grew up in those Disney characters, right. there, there was this, for me, this sense of betrayal that Disney often used black characters, you know, for, for spice, <laughs> you know, as a, like with Lion King, they've all done, right. you know, those are animals I know, but they're all done with white voices until you need, you know, Both, some soul yeah. in it. And then they bring in a black singer. Um, right, right, right. Even like Little Mermaid, right? The crab is brought in for a little color. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, that's, that's, no, you're, <laughs> you're exactly right. That's exactly what it is. If you ask me, and, you t and I, I would love to hear what you think about this, I think for people who saw a Goofy movie, Powerline himself was probably one of the blackest characters that they had that was cool, that kind of, you know, he was at the end of the movie, but he, he you know, it was something that people related to. And, uh, and he motivates all the action, right? Yeah. He is what sort of pushes them to go on this, this side trip. Right? Yeah. So, and so he not, is, in fact, the central character he's talked about and he's admired. Exactly. Right. So I think that black people said that this is the blackest Disney movie because they actually had something, a black character, essentially, that was featured in a prominent role up, you know, front and center. And so right. I think that that's what really resonated. And we and as a black community, we just kind of latched on to whatever we were given. You know, this just this little bit right here was was great for us. Right. Right. And it's 1995. Right. So there yeah. isn't a lot of options at Disney at that moment. No, exactly, exactly. And again, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that this is a bad thing. I'm not trying to be negative. It, it, it was 1995, as you said. Yeah. Um, no, thank you for asking. That was a really good back and forth to have right there. Uh, you know, you're talking about some of the movies that you did at the time uh, and a lot of characters that you that you worked on. Uh, Ursula from uh, The Little Mermaid. You have... Uh, Lumiere, Mrs. Potts, uh, Cogsworth, you know, uh, these are characters that you played, I believe, a large hand in, in designing. Uh, first of all, you must have a huge sense of pride whenever you see the impact that these things have had on our culture right now. And knowing that, you know what? Yeah, I, I get do. that. I do. I, I Yes. I mean, you, you said it. I'm, I'm overwhelmed. You know, almost almost daily by it, especially by a goofy movie, to be quite honest with you, because that, like you said, that that movie is probably the most admired of my films. Um, there's a huge community that just adores and loves this thing. I heard the other night, I didn't get to go because I live in California, but in Brooklyn, they had a this this drinking game theater experience where you, um, where every single time one of two words came up, you had to drink, and they basically acted out the entire script of a Goofy movie. <laughs> every single time you said son, every single time the character said son or dad, you had to drink. I bet those, that audience must have been sloshed yeah. by the end of it. Yeah, some of them but didn't make those it Those are the kinds of things that are happening out there, right? People are taking ownership of it in a huge way because it means so much to them. And that's what I find incredibly rewarding is that it means something to somebody that there's a lot of people out there that that take some kind of that have some kind of relationship with mm -hmm. the material that's why i make movies is i want to touch lives i want to move people and um that's one of the joys of of making disney movies to be quite honest with you is that you get to have some influence on the world in some ways right great and i saw a goofy movie theatrically and I'm, I'm a little older, so I saw it when I was uh, probably early 20s or maybe late teens. But I saw it in the theater. And, you know, wow. by that point, I was very aware that this was one of, uh, this was considered to be, 
you know, like the B tier of Disney movies. Yeah. You know, it was not like Absolutely. as you said, one of the expensive, one of the most expensive movies. Do you find? Well, it was made. By, it was made by the television division, right? Yeah. So yeah. right here and then, you're you're already talking about a smaller box. Exactly. Do you find a sense of irony here that of out of all the uh, AAA big budget uh, Disney features that you've worked on, animated features, that this is the one right here? The one that was considered yeah. not good enough, really, by the studio, just kind of a throwaway film in a way. Do you consider that that's the, that, that the crowning achievement of your career is this one right here? The one you're most proud of, at least. You know, I can't I, I, I can't really talk about my children like that. Um, so um, <laughs> I love them all equally. But I have to say that um, I am the most surprised by this movie. It is probably the movie that's that's closest to me because it means something. You know, I was able to bring something to this story that was inside of me. Um, you know, the story of fathers and sons is really something that sort of resonates and lives inside of a lot of my work. Um, Tarzan kind of has that same that same issue. Um, so so yeah, I'm I'm yeah I'm incredibly proud of a goofy movie. To begin with, it was just like a stepping stone for me. I thought, okay, I'm going to make this movie. Hopefully, it'll get me into Disney feature animation, or I'll be able to make a big animated film, which it did. It did work in that way. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't think of it as being something that would carry on or live forever. And of all the movies, this is the one. This is the one that 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 keeps um, keeps bringing love yeah. back to me, right? Yeah. I mean... Every every day, if I if I open Twitter, I'm shocked at how much you you know you look up a goofy movie and suddenly there's a whole roll roll of new, you know every single day people talking about this movie and how much it meant to them. Yeah, and please don't think that I was trying to demean your other works because those no those no no there, you know I love those no no not at all too. not at all I was I was kind of trying to joke around. Oh, okay, no, I didn't want because I, I, I <laughs> you've you've done so much that I that I, that I really admire. You know, and I think looking at a goofy movie, there's just something about this. It's two things that happen here, and it's and they almost would contradict. It's you would think that some of the more fantasy films are you know the, the films that are based on timeless literature like like tarzan you know you you would think right. that those would be the one to resonate the most sometimes because they do seem timeless but this is a more modern movie a disney movie i'm sorry a goofy movie that's a more modern film mm -hmm. and uh and i think that that's it's also a disney movie but yeah, yeah it's also go, a disney movie yes it is, it <laughs> is. yeah but you know the, the thing is that uh it's a more modern film though it's set in more modern times it is. and 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 you know and 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 then you have this cool factor with Powerline, which definitely that music is a staple of its time. But for some right. reason, I think because it is more modern and more hip, that is what has had lasting power with, with, with kids. Yeah, yeah. You know, at the time I thought, I can't really compete with The Lion King, um, which my wife was working on. So how do, I, how do I stand out, so to speak? How do we make something that's a little bit different? Yeah. Um, and the idea was to embrace contemporary life. Right. What are the dynamics of contemporary life that we can pull forward? Um, you know, it's still a fantasy. I mean, they are they are dog headed people um, <laughs> traveling across America. Um, people often ask me, why, why don't you do a live action remake? And I'm thinking like, well, well what what does that look like? What? You know, <laughs> a, a goofy movie is a goofy movie, right? You're not going to do anything with it that's going to be like, what, you're going to put dog heads on, on humans? That'd be weird. Um, but, but it was about, okay, how do I make something contemporary? How do I make um, Ferris Bueller's Day Off an animation, uh, right? Yeah, yeah. How do we make something that has some real, like a John Hughes movie and speaks to kids and parents today? Um, you know, and I was also lucky that I had a father and a son in the movie. Could have been a mother and a daughter, but a parent and a kid because yeah. it, um, it, it enabled me to talk to two generations, right? Two sides of a story. And um, what's kind of great about the movie is now that the kids who saw it when they were young and now adults now have children yeah. and are sharing it with their children. So <laughs> it's one of those things that kind of, you know, has like this cyclical ability to live forever, this generational ability to be passed on, which, which, I, which I adore. I love the fact that it's being shared. No, no I, and listen, I could talk about the Goofy movie all day, but I do want to cover something. <laughs> no, seriously, man, this is amazing for me to hear. I, I love this discussion here, and I love hearing it from you. But, you know, I, there's so much that you've done in your career. You, you, director, animator, 
uh, you know, storyboard artist, uh, 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 designer. Okay. And that's what I want to ask you about is uh, your approach to design, because you've had some very inspired characters that you worked on. Ursula, and we've already talked about, you know, the, uh, the characters in Beauty right. and the Beast. Right. Uh, what is your approach to designing characters, character design? Well, it's, it's so multifaceted, right? Um, it starts for me with, with what I'm trying to portray. So what is, so what is the character life? Um, what do I understand about the character at that moment? Because the scripts, usually when you're doing character design, the script is still in flux, right? So what do I understand? How do I portray that visually? You know, one of the great things about animation is that you can take a character trait and push it physically. Right. Um, so, so I think about those things and then it's a lot of pen on paper, to be quite honest with you. It's a lot of experimentation. I tend to do a lot of little scribbly roughs to begin with. And then when things pop for me, I then take those a little bit deeper. Sometimes there are assignments, right? With Ursula in, um, in the little mermaid, I was asked by, by Howard Ashman, one of the songwriters to do some designs that look like divine. Yeah. And so I did some research and I went in and, and did some designs, which were, which were, I think, far too grotesque for, uh, you know, for the studio or for, or for the directors at that time. But, but that was the idea. Some of those elements stuck, right, and are in the final de design, but she's somewhat more cleaned up than, than the designs I was doing. Yeah. I came on really early on The Little Mermaid. Uh, I was hired to animate on Oliver and Company. And they weren't ready for animators yet. So I was really lucky and got to do some character design, a whole bunch of character design on um, on The Little Mermaid. Yeah. And I did everything from Ursula and Flounder, some mermaid, some Eric. Um, I designed all the characters in Under the Sea and Kiss the Girl. Wow. So that was all mine. My wife, my wife was storyboarding. Brenda Chapman was storyboarding Kiss the Girl. And she said, I need a whole bunch of like um, pond animals, animals that would be around, you know, in a little lake. Um, mm -hmm. and so I just did pages on pages of drawings and she pulled them into, um, that sequence, which was nice, um, to see. It usually doesn't happen that way. It's usually <clears throat> you're designing after the storyboards have been, um, mm -hmm. done. So, so yeah, so that's, those are the kinds of things I think about. I, I also think about like subtext. Is there a way to bring subtext forward? So the character may present in a specific way, but is really someone else underneath. So how can I pull those elements, those hidden elements into the design and make the design work to, to tell the inner story and not necessarily the exterior story? And for those who wonder who Divine is, a lot of people do realize Ursula was based on Divine, but there's, there she is right there. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, there she is. Yeah, uh, uh, what, what do you call it? Drag queen is what it was based right. on, which you captured yeah. very well. You know, you, you talk about how you can just kind of effortlessly just draw these things, you know, just and, and multitudes of things. Probably in the short It's not time effortless, time. right? It's not eff effortless. It's a, it's a lifetime of drawing, right? I've been drawing since I can remember. So, so it isn't just sort of in the moment, sort of pulling things out of, out of thin air. It's, you know, it's, it's 18 years of drawing before going to college and then going to school for animation and taking life drawing and character design classes and storyboard yeah. classes, animating. It really is a culmination. By the time I got to Disney of 25 years of, of, of training, right, of drawing. Mm -hmm. But would, well, so, would you say that it has accumulated, you know, that all, all that has accumulated into a point where it just flows now? I mean, y'all, you know, it's, it's almost like muscle memory or second nature for you to draw. Oh, it was, it was. I haven't, you know, I do a little bit of drawing now, but I don't draw like I used to draw. Um, ever since starting to make some live action movies, I draw a lot less, to be quite honest with you. Um, even, even when I started directing, I was drawing less because you're, you're, you know, you're handling a whole movie. Mm -hmm. um, but I did do a bunch of you know, design work on those movies as well. Um, but, but yeah, it is, you know, when I, when I doodle, there are, you know, it's, 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 it's not like I have to think about it really. It just, it just happens now. Yeah. Right. It's, it, it's about training for me. It was about training what I could see in my head and having that come through my hand. 
right? How do you do that? Mm -hmm. How do you, you know, you can talk about it. You can say she's this kind of character. And I think that she needs to be like this and she needs to look like that. And this is what her hair needs to be. And this is how big her eye. You can talk, that's easy to talk about, but training it to come through your hand is a whole other thing, right? No, exactly, exactly. And you know, it's funny because I've talked to so many different artists and animators and right. uh, talked to somebody that had a, a huge impact on you, Glenn Keen, right. uh, at right. one time. Uh, huge impact on me too, to be quite honest with oh, you. Oh, no, I'll say you, I, yeah, you and me. But I worked, yeah. I was in his unit. I started, he had left Disney and was working at um, on the Chipmunk Adventure. So I went and actually, I worked on that after the Brave Little Toaster. And then he was working there and I was working in his unit. And I said, you know, he said, you should work at Disney. And I said, well, I applied and um, they turned me down. They said, you know, that they weren't hiring. And uh, he said, apply again. I'm going back. And I think that we can, you know, we can make this work out. So I applied again and they said, where have you been? (laughs) Where have you been? Well, I did apply and you didn't accept me. Um, But luckily I got in with with Glenn's help, I'm sure. And um, yeah. ultimately worked on Fagin and um, in that unit on uh, Oliver and Company, the Fagin unit. And it was so hard. It was so incredibly hard. Um, and endless hours sitting at my desk that I kind of discovered that I, I wasn't that kind of person, that I just couldn't sort of fold in on myself and sit at my desk for 10 hours a day. It was hard for me. Um, so I went in search of other of other things. I'd done some character designs. So I asked if I could go back into the visual development department. And I did that. And I did some storyboards on Aladdin. Um, so I tried that. And I think all of those things were kind of like training ground for me being a director. So I tried to touch as many things as I could, um, as many disciplines as I could. So um, was it the animation part that just wasn't pleasing to you as much as doing the character design layout and everything else? I like the, I like the moving from thing to thing, Mm -hmm. right? I like doing a hundred different designs for a character as opposed to doing this one little, creating this one little moment in a film and spending two weeks creating (laughs) two seconds of animation. That was kind of hard for me. I was also, before I was a, um, an animator, I was a puppeteer growing up and, um, um, I started as an apprentice when I was 15 years old and worked uh, every summer through college. And in that discipline, I got to do everything. So I got to build the puppets. I got to make, you know, it was a professional company. So there were like five of us in this company. And I got to make puppets. I got to write shows. I got to direct shows. I got to perform. So I was doing everything. And when it all zoned down and became this one little thing, creating this one little piece I um, I kind of couldn't. I, I I discovered I couldn't do it. I wasn't I wasn't happy doing it. Mm-hmm. So I, I I started to branch out. Man after my own heart. I love puppets. Also, <laughs> we <laughs> do a little, little puppet show ourselves on what we do over here. But you know, it's it's interesting that you're saying that. One, uh, do you miss drawing as much? Or it sounds like you're just kind of happy to just kind of move on and try different things. I, I miss it. And when I miss it, I do it. Um, I carry a sketchbook with me all the time still, you know, it's become sort of a part like to do lists and thoughts and filled with drawings as well. Um, I'm working on some projects and sometimes I have to do drawings for those projects Mm -hmm. to try to sell them. Um, so I still do that. Um, I miss it. I do miss it. And I think about it a lot. It's on my mind a lot. Um, there was actually, I was just walking the other day and I, came into my mind this this film that I never finished in my sophomore year at Cal Arts and I thought I wonder if I should finish that I wonder if that would be worth trying to do and what it would look like if I picked it up now and started animating again now all these years <laughs> later um but anyway I thought about that so it's always on my mind um whenever I'm doing a project I'm like constantly like putting together lookbooks I'm a visual thinker so I'm so I try to describe things visually as well as in writing. I'm doing a lot of writing to try to get projects up and running. Um, So yeah, I do, I do miss it, but when I pick it up, it tends to come back pretty quickly. Okay. And you know what, if you're thinking about that project, that probably means you should do it. (laughs) (laughs) When I think about 
sitting at my desk again all by myself. <laughs> oh, boy, can well, I do this? I don't know if I can do this. You can hire a lot of people now. You know, you got some influence. Yeah, but I guess I wouldn't be having to uh, to to please a director in Glen Keane this time around. And there you go. And plus, uh, you wouldn't have a studio in your back or a project pulled from you that you were working on for years. Exactly. But, exactly. Which we'll talk about to in a little that. bit. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah, uh, so you're talking about how you have these different roles and different roles require different levels of, of, you know, of animating and drawing and whatnot. So Tarzan, which you directed, which great film, you know, Glenn Keane directed it, directed it with, um, with Chris Buck. Yeah. He went on to direct Frozen. Yeah. Uh, Glenn Keane was, uh, talked about a lot for his animation on Tarzan, I believe. Right. Right. Uh, so as a director, who's also an animator. Do you do any animation at all on this? I did, you know, I did, I think I did one scene. I tried to do one scene of apes um, freaking out. Um, <laughs> something that was easy. Um, <laughs> because you don't have much time at all. Um, but, um, but no, for me, you know, being a director, it just, it just is all consuming, right? It's night and day. It's always on your mind. Um, you, you live the movie start to finish, right? So you're living the movie as a whole. So for me, it's about surrounding yourself with the best people possible. And I couldn't think of any, anybody better than Glenn Keane to animate Tarzan. And in fact, it was a tough sell. He, yeah. was, um, he was living in Paris at the time and uh, taking a break. And the way we, one of the ways we enticed him was to animate all of Tarzan at the Paris studio so he could stay and live in Paris. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So every single solitary scene of Tarzan was animated in Paris under his, um, in his unit. So he took on the whole staff. I think there were, I forget how many animators, maybe there were 15 <laughs> animators and, um, became, um, the character lead. In Paris. Oh, I, I I got that wrong because there was one other character in Paris that we did, and that was Sabor, the leopard. Okay. And um, we did that character there as well, um, because there was such, um, you know, there was so much interaction between those two characters. Yeah. Um, he, had, he had smaller, or she had smaller um, screen time, a shorter screen time, and so we thought we could do it with a couple of animators as a small little splinter unit in Paris. And he, he and get, um, um, Dominique Montfrey, I think is his name, um, worked together very closely. You know, this is before, you know, the digital age that we're in now. Of course, there was a digital age at that time, but we didn't have that kind of yeah. workflow. You know, I don't think things could be easily transferred like they are today. Was it, was it wasn't that? instantaneous. We did yeah. a lot. You know, we had to send the scenes back and forth through the mail. Um, wow. So, you know, if we had one person had done a scene, it had in, in L.A., say, say Ken Duncan had done um, his half on, on Jane, and we had to then pack up all those, that scene and, and ship it over so that they could, uh, they could do the second half of it. How difficult was that on production? Um, I think they, where they were used to it by that time. I think it was the most difficult, but I think we did okay, was communication, right? Was um, actually... How do you do a scene handout, mm -hmm. right? Over, over, um, you know, like what we're doing now, yeah. right? We had a very early version of Zoom, and um, you know, we both get in the room and we we just talk it through. And the way that I learned to do it was to physicalize it, right? Is you can talk as much, and and, and a lot of the animators didn't speak English, so I would <laughs> climb up on the desk and act like Tarzan, right? So I would be. <laughs> You know, I and there are plenty of printouts of me doing this. Like Glenn enjoyed pushing record every single time I got up on the table, but it was easier to to communicate in that way. And I was used to it because I had already worked with the French studio on a Goofy movie. Right? We animated all of a Goofy movie in Paris with that oh, same did. group of animators. So I knew them already, and I knew their strengths and their weaknesses. And on a Goofy movie, I was creating videotapes. So I would go through the whole sequence. I'd have the boards in front of me and a book, and I would go through the book, and I would act out the scenes like, oh, Maxie. You know, I would do that kind of thing. <laughs> and, um, um, and they would then use those tapes. We put those tapes in the mail, VHS tapes. 
we send them in the mail over and that would become part of the handout. Wow. Yeah. Until I could finally get over there, right? I, I, I did go over there and live there for about a year. Mm -hmm. And did you, so you lived there just for the production? Just for the production, yeah. Nice. Yep. Um, yeah. We're talking about how you know, much of an influence you've had on, on uh, animation. I mean, you know, to a point where you've made history with certain parts of animation. You are an animation family, though. You've already talked about your wife, Brenda Chapman, uh, right. who also has played a key role in animation history. Uh, I believe that she is the first woman to direct an animated feature from a major studio. That would be the Prince of Egypt. Uh, she also co-directed Brave. And when she directed... She was the head of story on The Lion King, right? She was oh, the head wow. of story. That started way back then. Yeah. And she so was, I think uh, she was the first head of story nice. at Disney. And first she, female head of story. Yeah. And, and she became the first woman to win an award for uh, Best Animated Feature. Uh, you know, what, what's it like? Yeah. What's it like being a, a couple that, it had, that has had <laughs> so much of an impact on animation history? Uh, we don't, uh, we, we don't ever think about that to be quite honest with you. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, it has its, it has its great points and it's, and it can also be difficult, right? There's, um, I'm fairly competitive, much more competitive than she is. So there was a time when, when the Prince of Egypt and Tarzan were actually coming out at the same time in the same year. Um, so that was, that was a little, that was a little different, uh, difficult. That was a little competitive. Mm -hmm. um, but I think as we've gotten older and we've raised a child and we've learned to collaborate in different ways, um, you know, it's gotten easier. It's gotten easier to support each other. Um, so, so, yeah, I'd say that I have a harder time leaving my work at work than she does. She can, she can put it away. She's much better at that. I want to come home and talk about everything. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we watch a movie and I want to instantly talk about it. And she's more like, can we just enjoy it for a moment? Can we just sit back and let it, you know, ruminate for a, for a couple of hours maybe? <laughs> or I just want to jump in and discuss the meaning of things and why the director chose to do certain things. You and um, I should watch movies together. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm more like that. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. You, said, you said you have a daughter. Uh, is she following in the family footsteps? She she is not. She um, growing up, she was a performer, so she did a lot of musical theater. But now she's actually in school um, to become an elementary school teacher. Oh wow! Wow, that's so a... she still wants to work. With, you know, she still wants to work with families and kids. So she's gotten that from us. Um, but uh, but no no, she doesn't. She doesn't. She draws, but not 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 for a career. That's interesting. That's kind of cool that she kind of took her own path. That's that's nice. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we and we really encouraged her to do what she wanted to do. So when she was in musical theater, I'm a big musical theater fan. I love musical theater. In fact, you know, every single movie I've made has musical components. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, it makes uh, in collaborating with my wife Brenda on things. I'm like, oh, could this be a musical? Can we put a song in here? <laughs> and she's like, Kevin, no more songs. This one does not have songs. <laughs> <laughs> um, she's not a big fan. She 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 likes a good musical, but she's not a huge fan. She doesn't go to see all the you know. I go to see everything, good or bad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, so yeah yeah. So yeah, she's uh and, and and for a moment when when Emma was wanted to be a performer, I thought, oh great, you know, yeah, I can go see all her shows. And but uh, she's kind of moved past that. Uh, look, I know you you have to go soon and you're short on time probably but i would like to ask you just a couple of things a couple of interesting things hey, yeah no 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 we can talk it's up to you i don't know how long your show is or okay what you i don't I, do. okay I, I don't like to keep people too long i was told i had a certain amount of time but i would like to ask you a couple of things you know because this is a very interesting discussion um so you have directed live action as you have mentioned uh yeah I, you directed a movie i really enjoyed which is enchanted uh it's a clever twist on the disney princess theme uh, right. So, uh, something I want to ask you about this, you know, before this was greenlit, I read that you couldn't get this developed or I couldn't get greenlit because it was too dark for the studio yeah. at the time. Uh, yeah. You had to, you had to, you had to tone it down in order to get this to get this made. Uh, no, that was actually actually that's not that that's not the truth. Um, is that the studio wanted to make a movie that was that was a little bit more had a little bit more edge. 
Oh, more like okay and then shrek came out right so so it was really dark to begin with when the script was first written it was very dark in fact she hooked up with a group of strippers and ended up at a bachelor <laughs> party she wouldn't strip and and you know robert rescues her so there was a lot a lot more darkness in in the movie they were concerned about that but they still wanted it to be really edgy and then shrek came out and they felt like shrek had stolen their thunder and when I came in, this was all before me, and I read the script and I said, listen, we need to go, a com you need to go a completely different route with this and make this a love letter to Disney. So fill it with, with all of the touchstones of what classic Disney movies are all about. Um, you know, it didn't, it had one song at the very beginning, had no other songs. I said, I wanted to put songs throughout it and help, um, help define the character through song. She starts singing in the real world. And by the end of the movie, the songs move out of her mouth and into the soundtrack. Mm -hmm. um, and they were a little afraid of that. They were a little afraid of what that would, um, what that would look like. But um, we convinced them. I did a whole sort of like run through hallway of artwork that told the story in visuals. And we got a green light to, to go ahead. Um, I don't think they thought it would ever have had the success it did. You know, they weren't really counting on it being successful. And it just surprised everyone. Yeah. And I, th and I think that has a lot to do with the fact that audiences do want joy in their entertainment. They don't want everything to be dark um, and oppressive and depressing. They, 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 they want, you know, they do like moments of, of of levity and lightness and joy and, and love and i think that's what this movie did is it embraced that part um of of sort of what is disney right disney is sort of that kind of um entertainment that that finds both the tears and the laughs and helps you come through the other side knowing yourself a little bit better Right. Yeah. And it was a great film. You did capture all that. That's that is why it worked. You know, exactly. You knew what you were doing with that, yeah. which, you know, yeah, I have to ask you. you so, so are you uh, you weren't brought in for 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 Enchanted 2 or Disenchanted, I believe is what it's called. Uh, yeah, I was I was not actually from the time that um, when 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 Enchanted came out, there was a, a change of leadership at the studio. And there were some political dynamics that took place at the time mm -hmm. that uh, that um, I was shown the door. Basically, I was saying like I was I was told like we um, we only want a plus directors here. We don't want Disney directors. It's basically what they say. OK, um, first of all, you... under, the, under the new regime, that's oh. what they said. Okay, that, that's insulting because first of all, yeah, as we it just was, talked about, it was, it was, yeah. it was incredibly insulting. Yeah, <laughs> it was no, that's, very, no, that's, very that's, insulting. That's, that's messed up, man. I had just made the studio. I had just made the studio three hundred and forty million dollars. Yeah, and, so, you, and and a lot of that was under your ideas, your guidance, and so then they tell you that they, they, the project that you pretty much came in and made it what it is. They don't want you for the uh, the sequel. Now, here's a, yeah. the thing with the sequel here: Disenchanted, at least critically was not as well received as Enchanted. So, you know, do, do, do you feel uh, you dodged a bullet there? I don't feel like I do dodged the bullet because if I had made that movie, it would be a different movie. Yeah. Um, but I do feel like, um, I do feel like they had different ideas about what they wanted to do. And I think that they didn't understand the spirit of the first movie. They didn't understand the tone of the very first film. Um, you know, the first film is, is, is generous and it, and it deals with <clears throat> subject matter that is, that is tender and touching. This kind of the sequel went for kind of like a balls out comedy mm -hmm. and it's in its feel. And I think that's one of the things that I felt betrayed when I watched it, I felt like, oh, they don't truly understand what the first movie was all about. Um, they, 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 they also, I think they also thought they could do a better job, that there was a better movie out there. And in that, they rewrote some of the, the character arcs, which I thought was interesting, right? Yeah. In the first movie, Giselle doesn't, at the end of the movie, she doesn't sing anymore. She's a real person, right, in the real world. And Disenchanted... From the very beginning, she's singing in the real world as if she hadn't grown. 
Yeah. And, um, you know, anyway, that's that's what it is. I can't control Hollywood. Hollywood decides what it wants to do for itself. Um, and all I can do is all I can do is react. What? So that that's so weird to me. And I, ne I never understand how Hollywood works when you it happens a work. lot. It's not you know, it's not it's not unique to me. Yeah. By any means. Right. So. Well, it's just weird that you've 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 done all these projects. You are a name. You 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 know you've done things that are very. It's successful. funny because I I I often think of myself as the invisible Disney director, as the as the one that doesn't get a lot of um a lot of credit for what they've done or is or is put forward. Um, so it's interesting. I mean, I'm happy to hear you say that, um, but <laughs> and I'm, I'm ha happy to hear that you think that. But I do think that sometimes I, I do I do kind of melt into the into the background in Disney in Disney history. In fact, when one of the things I just did when when um, it was for the fifteenth anniversary and when Disenchanted was coming out is I did a director's commentary that I shot myself um, talking about the movie so that I could have some ownership of the first movie. Um, and you can see it's on YouTube. I put it up on YouTube. You can watch the movie while you're watching my commentary. And I included a whole lot of little um, pieces that uh, that nobody's seen before because there's never been an art book, a making of book. So a lot of the pieces have never been have never been seen. I took a lot of video footage uh, during rehearsals of dances and stuff like that, um, which I included. So just as a way to sort of, you know, say... Um, I did. I did make the first movie, right? That I do have ownership of. Yeah, it. I, I, I'm so happy to hear you be honest and say that because I don't want to bring this up to to people because I even thought about asking you this, but you brought it up. But you know, I, I was going to say because I don't think, and I'm sure you do get respect. You do. You you get respect. You know, you get you you get the attention yeah. you deserve. But I I just personally feel like you deserve more. <laughs> and. You're, you're, you're a kind man. Thank you. Well, I'm just saying that because <laughs> that's my whole thing with art. I think that maybe I'm just too egotistical, but I kind of transitioned into doing what I'm doing now because I just felt like if I work, if I work in, I, I'm not good enough of an animator to be a star animator like yourself. I'm going to, if I, if I am an animator, I'm going to be a guy who's working on animation. And I'm going to do these, probably some really great things and do some scenes that will be remembered, but no one will know my name. And in and, and I've worked on games before. I've animated on games where I've I've gone and seen the boxes on the shelf. I'm like, no one knows at all. I'm standing here. No one knows that I worked on that. So you right, know, right. I, I, I and it just seems like okay. So that's that's appropriate for me. But you know, for for people such as yourself, I mean, I don't understand how that works. Where you just don't you know you don't get recognized like you should. Or at least you know coming from you, that's what you're saying. It's really no different than a video game in those ways, right? Because what they're what they're actually pushing is the title, yeah, right. And what Disney is pushing is their brand, their brand over individuality. Yeah, um, I understand that, and I signed up for that, and I'm I'm fine with that. Um, but but I do feel that at times it is okay to say, "Hey, I worked on that. I directed that." <laughs> um, that's all right. It's okay to take your piece of the credit for what yeah. you've, you know, for what you've accomplished. Yeah, no, no doubt. No doubt at all. And again, not saying that you don't get the respect that you deserve. A lot of people know who you are. You do. You're very well respected. You know, I respect you. But <laughs> well, Goof, well, Goofy Movie has done a lot. Yeah. That, right? People have really recognized where that came from and reach out to me constantly about it. That is true because when we, when I said to uh, you know our community that I'm going to be interviewing the director of the Goofy movie, a lot of people came in and said, hey, "Kevin Lima, you going to be interviewing Kevin Lima." So a lot, <laughs> lot, a lot of people are starting to know your name. So hey, it's uh -huh. coming around, man. You know? Yeah, yeah. It's kind of it's, it's it's interesting that it's that it's with that movie, right? I would have thought it would have been with one of the bigger movies, but I'll tell you, I put something up about a Goofy movie on social media. Boom, it explodes. I put something up about Enchanted. Beep. <laughs> and Tarzan, it's 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 impossible to get traction on social media for that for that uh, for that film. Really? So it's, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. I mean I guess I can see where a goofy movie would be the one right now. You know, there's just so many things. So many people are commenting on it and you know, you just had Atlanta that did it, so I can see why that's blowing that up. That blew my mind. I have to say Atlanta that Atlanta episode blew my mind because I didn't know anything about it. I found out 
with the rest of the world when it was released, you know, when it was uh, put on TV. I, I didn't know. I had no idea. I watched that thing going like, I mean, I, I saw it on social media. I thought, saw people talking about it and how much they loved it. And I went and watched it. I was like, what is this? How could this be? And I was just flooded with all kinds of emotion. Wait a minute. They're rewriting history. I directed a goofy movie. Um, <laughs> but then I realized, oh, wait a minute. This is something else. This isn't about me. It's not even really about a goofy movie. Yeah. It's social commentary on a whole other level. Yeah. And they're using a goofy movie to say something. And that's when I really felt like, oh, this movie has has made some real impact in the world. Yeah. It's it's funny because I know you directed the movie. I know who you are. Yeah. Um, and I think everybody who watches, yeah. you know, the um the goof that sat in the corner. Is that what it's called? The, 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 the goof who sat by the door. I sat by the door. Um and um I know that people who watch that know that it is fictional, right? I, I, I know that. But what I, what I really sort of got from it is it doesn't matter if they know that, if it is in fact bringing some, some light to life. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's just funny because I, 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 you know, I know you did this. I know who you are. And for just a split moment, I thought you were black. You know, I said I didn't. Did I, didn't I didn't. I said I don't. I don't remember this part of Disney history. I mean, maybe I missed something. It just they did it so well to convince me, you know. And I think that's what kind of brought people in is that they did such a good job with this. And then, uh, you know, and yeah. people already love the goofy. Movie. But by the end of it, it's so obvious, right? That it, that it is. Right? <laughs> oh, okay, all right. They're totally tipping. They've made their point, and now they're just kind of totally tipping. <laughs> now just being stupid right now. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but last thing I want to talk to you about here. And we're talking about, you know, we've talked about some of the great things in your career, some of the great things that you've, you've, you've experienced with Hollywood uh, and, and with Disney. And, you yeah. know, and now we're talking about one of the things that seems like it, 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 kind of a heartbreaking moment. You know, you spent years working on this film, The Monkeys of Mumbai. And you have some, yeah. uh, there's actually some work that was done out there on this, as we can, as we can see right now. I, I, I believe yeah. this is about uh, two orphan monkeys. Uh, and I, and, and, and I, don't, I guess their adventures after that, I'm not sure what happens after that because the project was canceled. Right. It was, it was, it was one of the, one of the biggest heartbreaks. Um, I worked on the movie for two years and um, we were just starting animation and Jeffrey Katzenberg decided he wanted to sell the company. And in order to sell the company, he had to bring down the debt ceiling on the, um, you know, on what they owed. And uh, he he basically shelved four hundred million dollars worth of product. That film. That is wild. In my to film, me. we had spent about thirty million dollars on it. Wow. And uh, and he shelved it. Um. So you know there are other projects that were much further along than mine, but. But it was really a heartbreak. It would have been, I'll tell you, it would have been exceptional, um, not only in the way it looked, but the way it was um, dealing with um, introducing another culture, mm -hmm. right? It took the story of the Ramayana and um, did a twist on it, brought it alive today, brought the, the, the character, the villain alive <clears throat> in today's world. And our two monkeys have to find their inner Hanuman, who is the monkey god, and... Um, and take down this villain that they've inadvertently brought to life. Um, and it was a big Bollywood musical with A.R. Rahman writing the songs and Stephen Schwartz doing the lyrics. It had everything going for it. So it was a huge disappointment for me. These are all what you're showing are all like video tests that we were doing early yeah. video tests. So, you know, her hair wouldn't have looked like that. Yeah. Um, but um, but it was it was it was heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. I, it, and uh, we tried to sell it. We tried to take it out and sell it. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, it was just too expensive for anybody to pick up. Um, yeah. You know, team wanted not only the full nut that they had spent, but they also wanted a percentage of yeah. the of the back end um, profits. Well, I have so, a statement and a question for you. And if you, if you, no studio would do that. No studio would, would take that on. Oh, that's too bad. So, you know, that's a. It sits on the shelf, right? And if, you know, for them to take it off the shelf, it means they have to sort of also take that money 
that they've already written off and, uh, uh, you know, pull it back onto the books. So there's so. no way to get this started again at all. I tried. I really tried time and time again. So that's, I don't, I don't think it's going to happen. I think there was also a little bit of worry in that the marketing department at DreamWorks was afraid that the movie wouldn't, wouldn't speak to, you know, middle America. Mm. At somehow being about, um, you know, Bollywood or, 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 you know, Indian culture that it would, uh, you know, that it would, that it would actually play. And, uh, so, so, so I think that became sort of a little knock against it. It, it seems to me, excuse my language here, but it seems to me that, you know, it just goes to show how full of shit Hollywood is sometimes because, I mean, you have experience with Hollywood more than I ever will. But well, it is called show business, by the way, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so show business. And I find that right now, that business, that word is getting bigger and bigger and show is just getting squashed down over yeah. here. Um, so it's tougher and tougher. I've been trying to make movies for the last 15 years since Enchanted come so close so many times and they always fall apart apart for one reason or another. Um, so I've got a few movies in development right now. I'm, you know, hanging on, hopefully they will happen. Um, but I haven't given up trying. Yeah, no, you shouldn't. I mean, I, I think that's a shame. I mean, you, you, Hollywood talks about like with things like privacy and, and, and other, you know, the, the other crimes that they mentioned, how, oh, we lose so much money, so much money is lost, it's hurting people, but then they go and shelve, you know, $400 million like it's nothing, you know, and I just, I, I just don't yep. get it with them, man. Um, so yep. there, were, there were five or six of us who lost movies that were pretty far along. So that's tons of money that's being lost. Uh, it, yeah. So yeah. What, what, does, this, what, does this push you to somehow can you even if it's with a smaller budget can you work m more independently or would you go to streaming now maybe where you have a little yeah bit yeah yeah i you know I'm, I'm willing to go to all different places you know one of the one of the movies i made was made for really what well, actually two of them were made really really cheap i made these eloise movies with julie andrews um that were made for tv and they were made for for very very small budgets so i'm not afraid to do things independently it's just you know, it's, it's two things, really. Finding a subject that you can make on yeah. that kind of a budget. Mm -hmm. And um, and my creative appetite really always falls towards something that's a little bit more fantastical. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I really don't want to make a domestic drama or a horror movie. <laughs> it's just not in my soul, right? So so I have a tendency to, to grab a hold of subjects um, that tend to cost a little bit of money. Yeah. So how would how are those projects going right now that you have? The They're going moment? good. I have a project that uh, at Paramount Plus, which is um, about a gender fluid kid who wants to have their Kinsanera, Kinsanera X. <laughs> and I have another project based on a book called No Flying in the House at Sony. Um, that's a big that's a big musical about a little girl who um, discovers that she's half fairy. Um, so, so get those two things going. And then I have a whole, a whole like bunch of things that are in development right now that are getting ready to go out to town. Um, but you know, the town isn't a healthy place at the moment. Yeah. So, so what do you do? Do you hold on and wait till it gets a little bit better or do you just swing for it? Are these animated projects or live action? They're both live action and they're yeah. both big musicals. Oh. I had another project that was set up at Netflix that they decided not to make that we've been reconceiving. Bill Kelly, who wrote um, Enchanted, oh, and I nice. are working on this project that uh, that was gonna be a series, but they decided not to move forward with it. So we're gonna reconceive okay. it as an animated film. Nice. Especially after seeing Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio, yeah. I thought, okay, there's some room for some more adult, you know, filmmaking and animation now. That maybe more, that maybe they'd be willing to take more chances. It really is nice to see that. I was a kid who always grew up, even as a young kid, I was, you know, I hated hearing people say that animation was just for kids. I for hated kids. that. Yeah. yeah. And I, I'm, I'm glad I'm living in an age now that I can see where that is completely changing, you know, so. Yeah, we were, you know, we were one of the few places in the world that felt that way, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, the rest of the world all embraced adult entertainment, uh, animated entertainment. So hopefully, hopefully we're, uh, We'll make some strides. 
Well, Kevin, this is this has been a great conversation. You know, I've learned so much Good talking to, talk to you. To you Corey. Yeah, no, thank you so much for that. People, Kevin Lima, legendary animator and director, multi-talented man right here, and a hero of mine, and more of a hero now that I've got I've learned more about him. It's 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 this has been a dream conversation for me. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Corey. Take care. You too. Bye bye. Bye. And there we go. That was supposed to be a 40-minute conversation, a 40-minute interview. And we had such a good time talking. At least I like to think that we did, that it kind of went a little further than we I, than I thought it would. That's why I was telling him earlier, like, I hope that I'm not keeping you here. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up because I knew that he had said that he had to leave at a certain time. But, hey, again, when you get somebody as interesting as Kevin Lima and a few of the other people that we've talked to, once they get going, they start sharing their knowledge. Hey, you know, they just they just keep going. And I hope you keep going with us with these interviews that we have because we do have a lot of them. And I have it ready right now, our page here, our channel, Double Toasted Interviews, where I've talked to many animators and artists and actors, directors, internet personalities, and they have all been not only very entertaining but very educational such as this interview that we did right here. So please check out Double Toasted Interviews if you enjoyed this. And check out all that we do here on Double Toasted. Uh, we do so much, and we do things with so much variety. I think there's a little something there for everybody. And that is it, everyone. Thank you so much for coming in and watching this. Hope you enjoyed it. Look forward to sharing more with you down the line. And... Always keep in mind that I appreciate whatever you do for us. We can't do it without you. That is why I keep my door open to you all the time through kcoolmans at gmail.com. That is K-C-O-O-L-M-A-N-Z at gmail.com. You email us with any kind of questions, comments, compliments, insults, input and our advice. Hit us up on our social medias, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. You don't see on there TikTok or Patreon, but they're there too. To get to any of those, just type in Double Toasted. It'll take you where you need to go. And if you find yourself heading to Austin, Texas, for whatever reason, you're moving here, or you're just passing through, let us know. You know, we want to give you all the quality time that we can. So email us first, kcoolmans at gmail.com, and let us know what your plans are for Austin. We'll try and clear. No, we won't try. We will. We would clear our schedules up and hang out with you. All right, everybody. Once again, I've had a great time with Kevin Lima. I have a great time with these interviews. I have a great time with you. So I hope you keep up with what we do. I hope to see you around here again. And I hope to see you on the next one of whatever that we do. Good night. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Whenever you are listening to or whenever you're watching this, goodbye and you know what to do. Stay toasty.